Hi folks, welcome back to Smug Mug Live. I'm Alistair Jolly, your host. Thank you for joining us today. As always, Smug Mug Live is brought to you by Smug Mug and Flickr. If you're looking for somewhere to showcase and share your work or indeed store your work online and have an e-commerce solution if you wanted to sell to customers and clients, then check out everything we have to offer at smugmug.com. Or if you're looking to connect with other photographers, be part of a great community, be inspired and motivated, then check out flickr.com. As I always say, thank you for joining us here on Smug Mug Live. This is episode 40. I uh, can't believe we're at number 40 already. Thank you for joining us, but it's always good to hear where you're joining us from. So give yourselves a shout out in the chat window while we're live on air. Uh, and it'd be great to see what part of the world you're joining us from. So get that in the chat window. And, you know, we'd really love it if you subscribed to the channel so that you'd be notified whenever we release another episode here. Uh, hit that little bell notification. That way, as I say, you'll be notified whenever we release another episode. If you enjoy what you're seeing today, give us a like on YouTube. It really does help support the channel and I would really appreciate it. At any point today, if you have a question for our guest or, or me, then pop that in the chat window. Do me a favor, hit, uh, type the word question before you write out your question. That way it's easy to find it in the chat window uh, and feel free to chat amongst yourselves in there if you want to help each other out and, and answer questions. Other than that, uh, wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for joining us. Let's see if our guest is here today. So for episode 40, we are joined by my good friend, Neil Freeman from the Nikon School uh, UK down in London. Hi, Neil, how are you? I'm good, Alistair. Thank you very much for uh, having me back. Um, real pleasure to be here. Good evening, everybody from the UK, whatever time zone uh, you're joining us from. Uh, it's evening here in the UK. So uh, um, great you've uh, chosen to uh, come aboard and sort of watch with us. Yeah, your uh, your audio looks very out of sync for uh, some reason at the moment, but uh, I don't know if that's something to do with just the way we've got it chained up today with the audio coming in. Uh, but if it stays out of sync, it's okay. We'll just hide your face and then we'll be fine. <laughs> okay, no problem. I'll be sharing the screen anyway. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what that is. It's coming through the Yeti mic, so uh, going into my Mac, not quite sure what that, what that's doing. It's normally in sync. It may just be out of sync with the, the video feed. Uh, it's funny, with all this new live streaming we're doing, it, it's interesting trying to find all the 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 ways that we, all the, all the buttons and all the switches we have to turn on and off to make all this work. And you can turn it on the very next day and it works very differently from what it did yesterday. So we'll, we'll live with it. But, uh, so you're, you, you've been on the show before, so this is the second time you've been on the show. So thank you for, for coming back. The first time you were with us, we were specifically talking about landscape photography, but we thought we'd have you back on the show, talk about portraiture, but the, the lighting of portraiture. And, yeah. yeah. Um, what we're going to be talking about tonight, what I thought we'd talk through is even though I'm with uh, Nikon, I have uh, I was a professional photographer before I joined Nikon. So I've got experience of sort of shooting uh, portraits as a professional photographer. Uh, we teach a lot of courses at Nikon School, a lot of creative portrait courses covering action, film noir, vintage uh, photography. Um, so we'll talk through, I was just thinking we'll uh, showcase uh, some of those images and I'll talk through the lighting, because um, whether we're using LED lighting, speed lights, or whether we're using off-camera flash or just ambient lighting, light is light. And that's one of the main things we need to understand to add more depth to our pictures um, and how we use that in conjunction with our focal lengths and, and the correct aperture. Cool. I'm going to ask you to do something live on air to see if we can help this sync. Your your video is coming to me via Ecamm Live, right? Um, no, I've turned no. that off. Actually, you turn that. Oh, you're okay. You're just coming yeah. straight through the camera. Okay. Yep. Oh yeah, you're using uh, probably using a cam link or something. Yeah. Right. I yeah. Might be play on the encoding. Yeah. So it's just the encoding slightly behind the audio, unfortunately. Uh, but okay, we won't do that live on air then. As soon as you, <laughs> we can't. We can't uh, adjust the, the cam link, but uh, we're starting to get a few shout outs in the channel. Thank you everybody for doing that. Yeah, it's always great to see where you're joining from. Uh, Cameron Weir has joined us, someone who joins us on uh, quite regular on the shows. Hi Cameron, he's uh, joined us from a grey overcast and cool Scotland, as am I. Uh, what part of the world are you in, Neil? 
Yeah, I'm in uh, Yorkshire uh, at Yorkshire. the moment, and uh, again, it's very cool, uh, overcast, and uh, looking like it's going to rain, which is um, no change from normal, really. Yeah. Uh, for those of you joining us, uh, you know, from other parts of the world, uh, you, you probably know, you know, Smug Mug and Flicker headquarters are out in San Francisco, uh, and yeah, it's it's, it's incredible. Out there. The images coming out of California at the moment are very surreal with the the fires that are happening, uh, the skies are just apocalyptic looking, to be honest, is the best way to describe it. The the, the image looks incredible, but uh, it's such a, a sad thing to see uh, with with all the fires there. So wherever you are in the world, we hope you're, you're safe uh, today and uh, yeah, look after each other. But it's it's quite incredible. Have you seen some of those images, Neil, coming out of? Yeah, they look. I would say uh, that sort of type of sky is what I like to photograph uh, from my landscapes, um, and it's sort of devastating for the the, the sort of um, the wildlife and the people and everything that's caught up in it. Um, but they, uh, yeah, they do look spectacular on images. Um, so stormy skies are something that I'm sort of so I sort of peek out the window in a minute and see if uh, I might go back out after this and uh, take my landscape gear and uh, go shoot some stormy skies. Yeah, but the, the stuff in California, it's not stormy though, it's just red. The it whole is. place is red with the 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 ash and the, the smoke clouds and the sun behind that. Uh, I saw some pictures shared from uh, Golden Gate Bridge and it's absolutely surreal, incredible. But we're here to talk about portraiture and uh, I just want to, do you want to tell people a little bit, maybe they, they didn't join the previous show, do you want to tell people a little bit about what you do at Nikon School? Might as well give Nikon School a little shout out, um, or Nikon School, depending on what part of what we're <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do we do at Nikon School? It's a uh, Nikon School in sort of uh, that's the way we pronounce it in the UK, Nikon uh, or Nikon uh, in other parts of the world. Um, we run training courses. So we're online. We have a huge range of training courses online. If you visit uh, Nikon School dot co.uk lots of training courses on the website there um, and you can join on those there's a range of free ones and sort of paid for courses we also do a lot of location courses whether it's location portraiture location landscapes location wildlife photography pretty much most genres we cover uh, myself and my colleague um, we sh we teach and we can shoot most genres of photography. Um, so if you're looking to sort of expand your knowledge, get creative or just come and find out some of the great spaces in the UK and well, even internationally, we go out to Iceland uh, once a year to uh, go and uh, shoot some of the amazing scenery that's over there. And also uh, we've done some portrait uh, photography over there as well. So lots of uh, courses, get creative with your camera, get out there and make the most of your images. Yeah, that's cool. And although it's uh, you know Nikon School UK, is there is there other are there other Nikon schools or is, is there a Nikon School in the US and out east? Yeah, uh, Nikon School. It's a, a global training um, operation for Nikon. So we have them in US, South Africa. Um, there are in Europe as well, across a number of different countries in Europe. So wherever you are in the world, um, there will be a Nikon School close to you. Right. But you want everybody to check out nikonschool.co.uk, right? <laughs> yeah, that would be great if you could. there isn't a .com version. Um, we, we have um, delegates flying from Australia and from Europe, uh, and they tell us we, we, we do the best training, uh, even better than their local organisation. So, um, yeah, we're, we're very pleased to hear that. So, uh, yeah, check out the website if you're interested in uh, sort of joining one of the courses. Cool. And are those courses, uh, well, They'll be online at the moment. I'm assuming you can you can join them online, yeah? Yes, you can join them uh, online. We have just restarted some of our location um, landscape courses. So very small numbers, uh, socially distanced as well. Um, landscapes, we, we can actually do that uh, within sort of uh, guidelines that the government currently has at the moment. Um, so we're running a, a small number of those at the moment. And we're looking forward to being able to gear up um, once we can do that safely within the, the guidelines. So um, we are restarting some of our location courses at this moment, but principally everything's online at the moment. Cool. Good to know. Uh, mentioned, uh, Cameron mentions in the chat, he says, Neil, you had a problem once before with your audio being out of sync on Zoom. Was it something to do with airport or something on your Mac? Um, I 
could be my Mac. Uh, I'm not using Zoom to be booting it. Um, I think uh, yeah. normally to clear anything. So um, just I think we'll, we'll, we'll live with it because we'll come with it. Turning it off and on again at the moment is not an option while we're while we're no. streaming live. <laughs> it's probably the solution, but not right now. Uh, so if you can just bear with the the sync issues, we would appreciate it. So do you want to share your screen and we'll get started today with the presentation? Yeah, let me just start uh, pull this up here and start sharing. There we go. Can you see Capture One? Yeah, you just need to hide ourselves. If that, there we go. Yep. Okay. So we've got Capture One up. So you're cool. going to use Capture One today to, to showcase these images? Yes, I will. I, I, I'm using Capture One or Capture One for Nikon as my editing platform, and I find it a really good way of showcasing images. Um, for your information, if you can see my mouse cursor down here, all the camera settings are down at the bottom of the screen there. Um, so I'll talk through them as we go. Uh, but if you want to glance at the They're settings for the camera, <laughs> yeah. um, I'll, uh, I'll talk those through as talk, we talk go about, yeah, they're, they're image as well. I'll talk through the techniques to about um, light as well. Yeah, cool. Uh, you mentioned it at Capture One for, for Nikon. Uh, so if you, if you have a Nikon camera, there's a specific version of Capture One for that? Yes, there is. So you can either have the full-blown Capture One Pro or you can have Capture One um, for Nikon. It's specific. Um, it just deals with sort of Nikon RAW files. And it, I, with my editing and the way um, it sort of the, pulls the color out, it's just um, there's something about it where I, I've, I've transitioned from Lightroom and I'm just preferring the output from uh, Capture One and how it actually handles color and sharpness. It's just sort of gives gives a little bit more kick to my image, which is what I like uh, as a photographer. Yeah, we've been very fortunate to have uh, David Grover from Capture One on the show a couple of times. Uh, so if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Capture One, and then go watch our previous episodes of Smug Mug Live uh, with David Grover, and he'll give you an insight into that world. Uh, but for today, we'll, we'll hand it over to Neil and let you talk through some of these portrait images. Cool. Cheers for that, Alistair. Um, evening, everybody. Um, one of the things we're going to talk about is light. So the first thing I really want to talk through is whether we're shooting with off-camera speed lights, whether we're talking with LED lighting, whether we're talking about um, ambient light. We need to understand light to make the most of our portraits. Um, light has four facets. So we have a quantity of light we're working with. We have a quality of light we're working with. There's a direction of light we, we are working with. And then there is a color of light we're working with. And if we ask ourselves those four questions, we can actually solve any lighting situation um, we were presented with. And we can shoot in any environment. I'm going to talk through sort of images that look like they're shot outside and they look like ambient light, whether they're actually off camera flash images or they could be video light images using LED panels. I'll talk through a range of images about how we actually go about creating those. So this image you're looking at here, um, this is actually shot in an alleyway next to uh, Nikon School in London. Um, you actually, if you walk past this, you wouldn't think anything of it. You'd actually look at it and go, I can't work there. One of the great things about using off-camera flash, which is my preferred way of lighting, is actually we can actually use, using the auto FP setting on the cameras, we can actually make unshootable backgrounds where, where we look at them with the ambient light. We can actually bring them to life and actually make them worthwhile locations when we're shooting uh, with off-camera flash. So on this particular shot here, I've actually got a SP5000. Uh, it's camera... Um, left here so it's coming in this side here it's in a soft box it's in a strip soft box I like using strip soft boxes or small square soft boxes they control the light spill uh, I use last light soft boxes they're great um, really well made and collapse down almost to nothing the key things with light is actually um, a speed light or our video light source LED panel um, they're generally small light sources and one of the key things the smaller the light source generally the harsher the light and the harder the shadows you're going to get from them. So the, the key with good portrait lighting is to get a large light source close to your subject. That will make sure that there's no shadows or minimal shadows uh, if that's the sort of look you're going for. And generally in portraiture, that tends to be the sort of um, approach we want with skin tones is sort of shadowless, 
And we'll show you some film noir portraits where we're actually deliberately using small point light sources to create hard shadows. Um, but it depends on the look you want. But I think for most portraits, what we'll look at is putting our speed lights or LED panels and put them through some sort of diffusion, whether it's a softbox, whether it's an umbrella, uh, whether it's a scrim or something like that. We can diffuse the light. We make the light source bigger. The light gets softer and therefore we lose all the shadows. Yeah. So, on, yeah. That's great. The, 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 I've got several SB 900s uh, and although they're super small uh, light sources, nowadays there are so many uh, modifiers and stuff available that you can really uh, get that small light source to create that big soft light source close to the, the, the subject. Uh, it's amazing how the modifier market has, has uh, changed and the last few decades there's so many things you can buy now yeah agree completely it's that's one of the things why i actually favor sort of uh, speed lights is because we've got um so many modifiers out there uh, there aren't quite as many modifiers available at the moment for led panels mm -hmm. um we have uh worked with uh rotor light for our led panels as well and um again great little light sources uh even their medium sized panels the aos panels are really really good um and we have some diffusers for those but i just find the flexibility you get with using speed lights off camera you can create all sorts of light i sold my um studio lights way back in i think it was around 2007 2008 and not really looked back on that um speed lights i can there's very few things i can't light with a couple of speed lights um and sort of some uh, gels and the sort of creativity that's enabled being either wireless or through the Nikon AWL, the wireless control system, or the CLS, the creative lighting system as well for off camera. Um, yeah. Talking about techniques here, um, as I said, speed light off camera here, light is coming in from the camera left here. Um, striking Courtney here. Um, what I've done here, so you can see on the settings, one four four hundredth of a second. Um, one of the key things you can do with Nikon cameras and, and most cameras, I think, but specifically Nikon cameras is put them into auto FP mode. That takes away the sync level. So we can go straight into high speed sync. The higher my shutter speed goes, the darker my background will get. Um, and then my speed light is used to illuminate my subject through the softbox. So I can actually darken down the alleyway here make the sort of light fall off more intense and actually then using i'm using ttl on this and flash exposure compensation so talk through how sort of we build an image with speed lights because this is while it looks like a complex image is shot in exactly the same way but this one's got two speed lights in it so i've actually got my softbox now camera right here and it's a strip softbox again speed light on ttl I have a CTO gel on this, color temperature orange. So it's a CTO gel that comes with the speed light. Clip that onto the front of the speed light. That's in the softbox. I have another bare speed light here to give me this intense hair light coming back here. So it will be put in, one will be in channel A, which will be my main light. This speed light will be in channel B. That gives me the ability to control different powers. So I could have this one on manual, and this one on TTL, and they fire simultaneously, but at different powers. So I can actually add more depth to my picture there. So the more speed lights we add in, the better depth we get to our picture. As you can see here, this is ISO 100, 1640th, F4, and 26 mil. Again, using the auto FP mode uh, has enabled me to darken down the background because this was shot um, middle of the afternoon. And this trick is really, really useful uh, to making sort of images that look really complex, but actually they're very simple. So why has the background gone blue? I've changed my white balance. So I'll come back to those four facets of light. One of them was color. The way to approach sort of portraiture is thinking about the camera's white balance will deal with the ambient light in the scene. So if I move my white balance in the camera, to around 3000 Kelvin, everything's gonna go blue, mm -hmm. okay? Including Courtney would be blue. 
if you want that look, great. But if I want the skin tone back, if I put that CTO, the orange gel on my front flash here, and using the com concept of sort of inverse square law where we know light falls off really, really quickly, if I've got this set at the correct power, uh, it's TTL and I'll probably exposure, flash exposure compensation minus 0.7, um, that means that the light, the correct light will hit Courtney, the skin tone will be correct, but it doesn't fill in over here because we know inverse square law means light falls off really, really quickly. So just using two flash guns, a bit of orange plastic and changing our white balance, we can actually get really creative images. Yeah, that's a great image. And I, I love the the use of gels and it, it it can be a little bit confusing, but you've explained it really well. But you know, you're just you're setting that cool the cool temperature, that cool look is set in the camera, and then you're using that CTO just to correct the, the, the skin tone. Uh, and you're using TTL flash, so the camera's actually managing that output of that flash, Yeah. Right? Yeah, it is. I find the um, Nikon TTL um, to be, in most cases, super accurate. Um, you can get the same result using manual mode on the flash gun if you want, setting it to probably about six, uh, sixteenth uh, power, maybe an eighth. Um, but I tend to find my preferred way of shooting is TTL and then use flash exposure and compensation just to fine tune it. And one of the great things about how we how we shoot with the, these cameras using either the SU800 controller or using the creative lighting system, I do that all from my camera. I don't have to go and touch the flash guns. It's all controlled from my camera. So I can actually be a long way away from my subject and still change the power on the flash guns. And there's many times when I've been using gels that actually I'll have one speed light, perhaps group A will be on TTL flash exposure compensation if needed. And then the other lights, say B or C, will actually be manual mode, full power or something if I want to play with gels and maybe illuminate an entire wall or building or something like that. So it gives a, it's a really, really flexible system. Love playing with gels. It, you can create something that, uh, that looks really complex really quickly and really easily. Yeah, and I know, uh, obviously, Neil, being from Nikon school, is specifically talking about all the, the, the sort of language of Nikon, but you work with people every day of the week, and they come to your classes not, some of the, a lot of them aren't using Nikon gear, so you're, you're pretty familiar. So if anybody has a question about this, uh, even if it's not based on Nikon gear, I'm sure Neil has... Uh, has the answer putting you on the spot but okay. yeah we, we we do have delegates coming with on creative courses we run like this it's about light and understanding how to work with light so um we've taught people with sony cameras fuji cameras canon cameras i used to shoot prior uh to um have, well d3 is when i went across to nikon which seems like a long time ago but that was a phenomenal camera yeah. um I uh, yeah, traded in a lot of uh, Canon kit and transferred across and never looked back. Um, so yeah, D3 was when I moved to Nikon and that sort of opened my eyes with what I can do with the sort of uh, flash guns and sort of yeah. creativity of that camera. That's interesting. That's a little nugget I didn't know before that you weren't always Nikon. Not always, no. Yeah. And that gives me the background, I think, to enable to teach um, sort of the, yeah. the other brands as well because I'm familiar with the, the, the systems. All the, all the workings. Cool. One of the big things with portraiture um, is understanding your um, sort of focal length. As you can see, this is shot at 200 mil at f2.8, 1 400th of a second, ISO 100. OK, you can see it's a giveaway. Always look at the catch lights. That's a dead giveaway as to where the light source is coming. So this is a very small softbox. It's square on onto uh, Courtney's face here. And I'm just shooting around the side of it. I'm shooting with my 70 to 200 f 2.8. That is probably one of my favorite lenses. I have probably three great lenses, uh, 70 to 200 f 2.8, 200 f 2. If anybody's ever shot with that, that is, um, it's, I know it's quite an exotic lens, but it is just, beautiful. Uh, just amazing. It just has a look to it. Um, one of my other favorite lenses is a 105 f 1.4. That's a great lens as well. And some of the new Z series lenses, the 85 mil is beautiful. And if you have the budget for it, we were lucky enough to be able to play with the 58 mil F 0.95 
uh, knocked lens. Now that produces beautiful bokeh uh, in the background. But for a more realistic approach, having sort of like the 105 f1.4 or the 70 to 200 f2.8, understand your lens. Now, if I get chance, and this is why I like a 70 to 200 f2.8, and I've just uh, been lucky enough to get hold of the new uh, S series VR version for the mirrorless cameras. It's astonishingly sharp. This uh, this was this particular one here was shot on the 7200 E series, uh, the FL lens, and I thought that was fast and I thought that was sharp. And the new S series one, which we've just launched for our Z series cameras, is even sharper and even faster at focusing. Um, just an incredible piece of kit. Um, the thing about focal length is actually just understanding. Is it better to shoot at 70 mil? Is it better to shoot at 200 mil? If you've got the space, you'll be surprised. Try this if you haven't already done this. Try and shoot some of your outside portraits at 200 mil. OK, stand back from your subject. One of the things shooting at the longer focal lengths does, it compresses the perspective on the image. What it actually does is your depth of field changes. So at 200 mil, your depth of field actually gets smaller. So it's smaller than it would be if we shot this at 70 mil at f2.8, the background blur would not be as good. That's why I love shooting at 200 mil at f2.8 if I've got the space. Now, it's not always possible to do that. Sometimes we have to take our 50 mil or our 85 mil and shoot it at f1.8 because we're inside. But I love the look of shooting 200 mil at f2.8. You get that beautiful separation between your subject and the background. If you combine that with off camera flash or off camera lighting, what you'll be able to do is add even more depth to it. Because when we light our subject, if we think about this when we're using ambient light and have a lot of conversations with people about, oh, I don't like flash guns, I'm an ambient light shooter. Once we've explained flash is not as complex and as scary as everybody thinks it is, the, the, the thing with ambient light shooting, well, I've done that and it is appropriate in some situations, but let's think about if we're outside. The same amount of light is falling on you, the floor, the building, the cars maybe. There's no depth with the lighting. If we now actually light our subject, we change the lighting ratio in the picture. And by changing the lighting ratio in the picture, our subject now becomes brighter. And we use controlled lighting on our subject. That means they can now be made brighter sometimes than the background especially if we deliberately underexpose the background away. And just using that very simple trick, we can actually now start to create some very, very standout portraiture. A great point. Um, I, I hear a lot of people saying that they only like to shoot with available light rather than, yep. than using flashes, but um, I always considered my flashes available, so I used them. <laughs> <laughs> That is a great way of looking at it, yeah. actually. Uh, yeah, available light. What, what available light have what I got? Have I got... see some speed lights. That's a great way yeah. of describing and it. Especially, <laughs> especially with small LED panels and stuff. They're yep. so light and so easy to, to use. And, yeah, they're always available. So that's available yep. lighting is appropriate. <laughs> This, uh, this, this one here is a good good trick as well. So you can see I'm uh, still on my long lens here at 185, 185mm. This is actually a DHL courier van. So it was just showing you that <laughs> if you stand back, you can actually turn DHL courier vans into quite an interesting background if you're out on the street and you're looking for sort of creating some sort of sort of uh, different type of background. We were in a very, very urban environment. And it was just look at your environment. If you stand back and shoot portraits at long focal lengths, what you'll be able to do, certainly at f2.8, if you've got the 200 f2, that looks even better. Um, but if you shoot a long focal lens, we can take an everyday van and actually make it quite an interesting background, make it work for us. That's funny. So if someone asks you, hey, Neil, what's your favorite backgrounds that you use? You see delivery trucks? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They're all over the place as well. But if you think about it, actually, as a sort of in the UK, one of the most common vans is a white transit van, isn't yeah. it? And white van think, about, uh, think about outside, what, what are most reflectors or... A, a, a bounce card. How do I make a turn a quick speed light into a big surface? If there's a white van by me, um, I've it. now got a portable uh, bounce. Yeah. So um, it's outside. It's really easy to do. Um, I learned that one from Joe McNally. Um, he sort of uh, 
uh, showed me that on um, one of his shots, and it was just and you're like, oh, that is so obvious. If it's Why good enough for Joel, then we can all steal that idea. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, um, <laughs> it was really, really clever. And again, here, this is one of the things I like about sort of, is this available? Like, yes, it's. It, I haven't waited for the sun to get into a certain position. Um, and this comes back to, we talked earlier about quantity of light, quality of light, direction of light, color of light. This is really playing with direction of light. So light probably has three main directions. You can choose to shoot with it. You can choose to shoot into it, or you can choose to kill it. Um, here, what I've done is I've changed the main direction of light using uh, my shot here. says so 1 320th, f2.8, 122 mil, ISO 100. What I've actually got here, I've darkened down the background deliberately, and I've now just fired a speed light, which is being held above uh, the hat here, and that is faking sunlight coming through. Um, a lot of this was being posted on Instagram a few years back like this. And sort of we had a lot of people asking, well, where, where do you go? Where, how do you know you're going to get sunlight like that? Well, you don't. It's easy to fake. Um, as long as you've got a straw hat like that, speed light held above it. It's a bare speed light because I want intense shadows. So this is not a diffused speed light. This is an intense speed light. Uh, so a bare one giving me the hard shadows. That's a great effect. We've got a nice comment come in here from uh, Gary Monroe, who's watching. He says he's he's hugging his six-year-old 70 to 200 2.8. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of love for the 70 to 2.8, including for me. It, it's just a great lens. Yeah, um, yeah great lens. Great uh, focal length. It's so so versatile and yeah. you can make a lot of money with the 70 to 2.8. 70 to 200 2.8. Let's just talk about Nick here. So again, this is, we're very lucky when we're um, around sort of the area we, we shoot in, in London, uh, lots of really nice background. Well, this is actually a service street. This is the back of the end, the, the, the car park. Um, but we can actually, again, this is middle of the day. This is not late at night. This is just one speed light creating sort of that backlight rim light effect. And I'll move on to some film noir shots in a second while I talk about building pictures. So we've got Nick here, rim lit, and I sort of give him that sort of rugged sort of look, um, sort of that he's a character actor, um, and he sort of um, just, I think the lighting really works for him in this kind of um, sort of scene. I think that sometimes there's some sort of light. Um, I know a lot of people talk about, oh, you, you wouldn't like, you've got male light, you've got female light. I, I just, I, I don't really subscribe to that. I sort of, the light works for the scene or it doesn't. It doesn't matter whether you've got females or males in them. It, it just, the, the light is right for the scene or not. Um, and so I just light for the actual scene I'm actually shooting. So this is a bare speed light and I've deliberately kept it on the edge here just so you get an idea of where it's coming from. And we get this beautiful rim light. Uh, this is 1600th of a second ISO 200 F 2.8 at 200 mil. Um, so it starts to give you this look. Let's talk about building pictures, which is the easiest way uh, you can actually start working with flash guns. Um, one of the things we can do when we're working with flash guns is build pictures. Now, how do we go about building a picture? What's the easiest way to work with light, whether it's an LED panel, whether it's a um, flash gun? If we're going to work with some of that, that sort of lighting, First thing to do is dial in a low ISO into your camera, ISO 100, ISO 200, okay? We're agreed that that will give us a high quality picture. We'll then dial in our aperture. I like shooting at f2.8, f4. I generally, my baseline is generally f4 is where I start. And then I'll dial in a shutter speed. And that's normally around 1 200, 1 250th of a second. And I'll take a shot. Now that scene gives me a baseline to start building my picture. Normally those settings, unless it's a really, really bright day, is going to give me a dark underexposed scene, okay? So we use our camera that way to now deal with the light in our scene, our ambient light in our scene. If I now raise my shutter speed, the scene, the ambient light, the available light will get darker. If I was to drop my shutter speed, the ambient light will get brighter. 
Uh, it's the quickest way of balancing. Yes, I know we could move our aperture to do that and we could move our ISO. But if I bring my ISO up, I'm not going to have necessarily as clear a picture or as clean an image as I would if I shoot a low ISO. And if I move my aperture up or down, I'm going to lose the control over my depth of field, which is why actually I control it like this with my shutter speed. So we set a low ISO, give a good quality picture. We set, um, again, if you like shooting at f1.4, f1.8, great, shoot there. If you like shooting at f5.6 or f8, again, shoot there. Just set your aperture that's appropriate for the picture you want to create and then control the ambient light with your shutter speed, moving it up or down. What we then do is we bring our lighting in and our lighting is what is going to strike our subject. OK, and that is how we build the light on our subject. So the camera controls the ambient light. Our light is what falls on, whether it's a speed light, whether it's an LED panel, that's what falls onto our subject. And we control that. And that's why a lot of pictures you think may be shot by ambient light are actually speed lights faking it. Uh, this shot here of Monique, uh, we had sunset going down the street behind us here. Um, this is just a quick fill flash shot, but the, the flash is in a two foot by two foot softbox. Uh, which is sort of being held above here slightly. Um, and I'm just shooting underneath it. So I'm balancing this very, very intense light that's coming down the street here. As you can see again, uh, longer lens, so 105 at uh, F2. One of the great things about the Z series cameras is the eye tracking now. So I've moved from my D850 onto Z series and eye tracking i'm sort of that is what i use face tracking and eye tracking I'm becoming a bit lazy with focusing because it is that good um i just know it's going to nail it even at f2 it's going to distinguish between an eye and an eyelash it is really really good it's not being lazy i remember years ago someone told me when autofocus first came out that it was lazy and i said it's not it's being smart it's like if, if autofocus gets it correct more often than i get it correct then it's the smart thing to do is is you know use autofocus and now with the the eye detection stuff it's it's quite incredible yeah i i go back to i think sort of when i used to shoot weddings and things like that if we had eye detection stuff like that again that would have made my life a whole lot easier yeah. i think it was sort of uh yeah we do embrace the technology and uh, there's a lot i've i can forget about from when i used to shoot my film cameras way back um technology has moved forward metering we don't need to be as precise now because the cameras are just that good at it um but yeah it's a that's a really really good point um i'm just going to show you an image here about um sort of this is 200 f2 look at how the background goes it just go you, this is sort of a fire hydrant this is a really um sort of office building here and you just get this standout at 200 f2 long lens as you see it's 200 of second iso 400 on this this is speed light off camera coming in from camera left here the and again off, of, the fall off and focus on the on the surface of the road there is just beautiful it's just so yeah. smooth it is a t t astonishingly good lens um similar one here you just get this 3d effect with it it is just um just incredible uh, off camera flash light is coming in from the left here in a strip spot soft box as well this one is a bare flash with just a cto gel it's not sunset it's not sunrise it's not a street lamp um that's um actually i've got one of the delegates holding the uh, speed light high above uh, just an orange gel on it I've left it bare so we get this beam of light. The speed lights have something called zoom on them where we can zoom the head. Normally what happens is when you put your speed light on your camera and you change your focal length, the speed light will automatically zoom the light and throw the light to match your focal length. And depending on which speed light you've got, it depends on how far it can throw the light. They will vary. However, when we go off camera, we can use that. We can use that creatively. So if I shoot wide here, which is, what is that? That says 62 mil, but I set my zoom on my flash to 200 mil, my flash is going to put out effectively a spotlight beam. And that's why it's just clipping Danielle here and it's not illuminating the rest of the scene. I made the rest of the scene dark because we've used our uh, sort of one two thousand five hundredth of a second ISO one hundred f four. So 
it's synced with the flashes because we've got auto FP mode set switched on. So I don't, I'm not constrained to one two fiftieth, one three twentieth. That makes the background go dark. And then the speed light, because it's on zoomed at 200 mil, gives me this very tight beam of light. A great trick there is use the zoom on your speed light. Yeah. If you're stuck for a background, Christmas tree lights are brilliant. Just shoot them around F2, F1.8. Uh, that's all these are. This is Christmas tree lights hung off of a background. And I've got an LED light coming this way. OK, this isn't window light. The window is actually this side. OK, um, the reason why we wouldn't look into the window is because I've got no control over the amount of light coming through that window. Uh, we don't have curtains on it or anything like that. But if we do it this way, I can turn up and down my light source coming in from this side to whatever I want. If I shoot across here and then shoot a low F number, I get a nice bokeh background. Christmas tree lights are amazing to shoot into. I uh, can create some really, really cool patterns with this. Looks great. That's uh, what else have we got down here? Um, I was going to talk about, let's talk about some ambient light pictures. Um, what have we got here? Here we go. So this was shot in Iceland. Uh, we were doing a Game of Thrones uh, style shoot uh, when we were out in Iceland earlier in the year, just before lockdown. And this is shot in ambient light. It's one of those things where um, we had some ambient light um, and we had, were going to go and shoot with flash guns and soft boxes. One of the problems with flash guns and soft boxes or any soft diffusers and modifiers on location is that they act as sails. Coming down this valley was a wind speed of something like 50 or 60 miles an hour. And it was quite entertaining. The behind the scenes footage we shot on this of three or four people trying to hold a softbox down and stop it flying away was quite entertaining. In the end, we just decided that even though that was going to give us better light, we were fighting it too much and we didn't have enough time. So we just went to ambient light. And in certain cases like this, the sunlight was being diffused from going through the clouds. So we were getting some, some nice light anyway. So we were using the, the um, light accordingly that was easiest to shoot with. I do like black and white portraiture here. Um, here, Alfie has one speed light coming in front of him and there's another one behind him. We've shot this at uh, 1 60th, and this is at F8 because I wanted a really big depth of field. There was a lot of, this is a disused warehouse, there was a lot of stuff in the atmosphere floating around, and it was, I really just wanted to pick that all up as I was shooting here. So two speed lights on this particular one um, to give us sort of that real intensity of look. I had shot all these in color. I converted them black and white uh, in post-processing. That's the way I actually sort of like to convert my images. Um, but it does give, I do like black and white portraiture. I'm a big, big fan of film noir portraiture. Um, so we're here, we were looking at, if anybody's seen sort of brief encounter or that sort of thing, we have, this is LED lighting and smoke machines. This is not a, a proper steam train. The steam train is not going anywhere. These guys are reenactors. They're really, really great. But this is a smoke machine and there's an LED light coming through the back of this. So we're just deliberately, I've not bothered with um, sort of filling in the area here. And we just had them turn their face into the lighting just so we can pick up the light on this side of the face. So it's not a complete silhouette. Um, again, we're shooting 200 mil just to sort of compress that perspective on the shot. And as you can see here, I'm at ISO 10,000. That's one of the things If we're going to use LED lighting at night. Um, my ISO is going to have to go up. It's not going to be as low as if I was shooting with speed lights. Um, so that's one of the compromises you would make if you're going to use a sort of uh, LED lighting or anything like that is your ISO is generally going to be higher on the most part than it would be than if you were going to use speed lights. Just but because you can they still... don't have enough, uh, they don't have the power output that a speed light would have? No, yeah. they don't. Even though they look big, they, they, they seem to be, they are, the, the power they put out is, is very, very small. Yeah, Here's and even when you're, when you're looking at them, they feel blinding to the eye and they're yeah. really super bright, but they're nowhere near the that instantaneous burst of power output that a speed light could do. Yeah. 
And again here, um, we've got this strip, these blind effects uh, transfer on the window. So this is one speed light there coming out through the window here. Just making sure that amber is positioned in the gap here where it's going to come through. Um, rather than you move your speed light back and forward, it's easier to just ask amber to move her head up and down. Um, so, yeah, rather than you play with your light, just sort of direct your model accordingly um, to move her head into the light after you've done a couple of test shots here. But this is deliberate use of their speed lights. This is a single speed light behind a subject. OK. We're using, this is shot inside, one five thousandth of the second with a speed light, F2. Uh, so this is the 58mm F1.4 um, I was using here. And we get that just one singular speed light. By going to that high shutter speed inside, it makes everything go dark. To behind here, there's a door, there's a fire exit sign, there's another window, and you just can't see it because um, this is a really, really great trick, the way I've described about setting up the, the sort of images there. And again, black and white outside, single speed light, single light source coming from camera right here, coming in and just illuminating our subject here, uh, fails. So great character actor as well. Um, looks really good as sort of the film noir detective. And this is just using, I like the way the, this is, um, this is sunlight hitting this back corrugated garage panel here. Um, but I'm lighting fails with um, the speed light on the front here. And if we actually just turn the light behind him now, we can do that. So single light out on the street, same street. I've just moved the speed light the other side of him and we can shoot into that and we get that sort of man in the shadows type effect as well. And this is again, use different lighting. So this light here, if I now go square onto it and keep it in, the, you can see it here. Okay, I've deliberately left it in the frame to create this sort of spotlight effect. So I've not changed the lighting, I've not changed my camera settings between these shots, I've just moved my position. And we get two completely different images depending on you moving around. Most of the time we get the opportunity to move sort of 180 degrees maybe around a subject. Sometimes we can move 360 degrees around a subject, but move your feet. I think sometimes zoom lenses, as much as I love my 70 to 200, um, it can make me a bit lazy. I forget I've got feet. Um, so move, your composition can change and um, the way the light falls can look really, really good. And again, inside, if we're inside here, we can create some interesting shadows. Just think, I was talking about quantity of light. So how much light do you have in your scene? Quality of light, is it hard or is it soft? So here I'm using bare lighting to deliberately create the shadow. Now, normally you'd say have your subject three or four foot away from the wall because you don't want that shadow. But if you put your subject on the wall, you're going to get a hard shadow. If you play carefully with the direction that the light's coming in, what you can do here is give this really interesting shadow effect. And then we can do it, different subjects, sort of exactly the same lighting. Um, bare speed lights or bare LED panels work brilliantly for this type of shot. Let's look at some action portraits. Um, let's look at these guys. So these guys are professional stunt uh, um, actors and actresses. Um, Phoebe and David, uh, they're great. And we hire out a, a disused nuclear bunker. It was where the government in the UK was going to hide during the Cold War. It's just outside London. Um, it's sort of, you can hire it. It's a, it's a place for tourism now. Um, so it's more of a museum. And we put them in there. We have the suitcase. And does that have the nuclear codes in it? Um, we sort of, these guys just do stunts. They're just brilliant um, and sort of, they can do leap and then Phoebe getting her own back. Um, so these are shot uh, ambient light inside a studio. So it's at ISO 8,000, of a second. This is shot, this is cross lit. So we can see the soft box here because it's reflecting off of here. This soft box here is lighting Phoebe. The one out shot here is lighting uh, JP as he's jumping. And we've just thrown a smoke machine in here as well. And as you can see now, the this shot is, if I turn around, this is behind me. Uh, so this is no lighting on it. I have to use ISO 8000. 
But if I'm using my lighting on the going this way, I can get it down to ISO 500. So actually using sort of not shooting ambient light uh, does give you a higher quality picture. One of the things they've got here is just an interesting thing here. Gels again. So we're doing a little bit of a matrix type environment. They have an armory at the these are all decommissioned weapons. Um, they have an armory here at the bunker that um, actually um, David's holding a plastic gun as well. Um, so I've got single speed light coming through here with a green gel on it using the wireless trigger because this is quite a distance. And even with all this metal that potentially can interfere with the wireless triggering, this um, just works seamlessly. And there's a so bare speed light just popping in here, just to backlight Phoebe. And then we can just change our zoom and we get sort of same lighting, just change your crop, change your position. This has got three speed lights in it, all with green gels on them and a fourth one here in a soft box just to pick up this side of um, uh, David. Um, just so sort of we get that sort of it's not an all green type effect. So we can do some really creative things with speed lights. They're all on TTL um, and they're all uh, flash exposure compensation to make sure they're giving the right sort of output. And it's 1 to 50th F5.6 ISO 400. So can I just ask you something? So you're, they're all on TTL. So, um, you know, the, the, the camera is looking through the lens and deciding what the exposure should be. But you're creating a ratio effect by using individual compensation on each each light. Flash gun. Yeah, that, exa that's exactly it. Yeah. yeah, and that's why. And I'm doing that from the camera. I don't know because the lights are. Well, you can see one here. There is one tucked behind here, uh, pointing back, giving us this backlight, and there's one way over the back here. Um, so yeah, when you're using multiple lights, one at a time, you turn one on. You get that right, you then turn it off, and then you turn on your other light. You get that one right to where the shadows you want, the, the, the light you want, turn that one off. Then you turn your third one on if you're going to three lights. You get that lighting up, turn that one off. Now you can bring them all back together. And when you turn them all back on, because you've tuned them individually, there shouldn't be too much fine tuning left to do to your final image. If you're going to use multiple light sources, please don't turn them all on at once um, because you've got no idea which one's giving you that annoying shadow that you don't like. Um, so do it one at a time with your lights. I know it might sound time consuming, but it actually it saves you less time fault finding the, 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 the various different lights, giving you the shadows you don't need in your pictures. Those are great. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen for uh, at the moment because I think you're we're losing the quality of the feed, unfortunately. So apologies for that, folks. Your uh, the bandwidth is not helping us tonight. So apologies for the slight sync issues we have with the audio and Neil's lack of uh, clarity, shall we say? <laughs> you're you're very broken up at the moment, unfortunately. It's not his camera that's out of focus. It's just the bandwidth that's that's not coming. Um, I wonder if we could uh, take a few minutes. We're nearly at the top of the hour just to talk about. We touched on some of the advantages of uh, f speed lights, flashes over LEDs. What are some of the other benefits of you know, your pros and cons of each of those systems, either flash or, or LED? So um, we've, uh, let's start with um, ambient light or available natural light, whatever available, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. It is there, you can see it, you can see the shadows it's generating. Um, it is just, it's easy. You point your camera, the camera works out the metering and you've got your picture. Yeah. And it's easy to shoot with. Um, and it's a great place to start. When we now get into using um, sort of man-made lighting, whether that's LED or whether that's flash, if we're going to go down to uh, LED panels, um, we discussed earlier that, that they're not as, they can't put out as much power as a flash gun could put out, mm -hmm. but they're mm -hmm. good. They can be very, very portable. Um, a lot of feedback I get from models we work with is that they don't like actually looking into or looking at LED panels because they can become quite intense and quite bright, even with diffusers over them. Um, they much prefer working with speed lights in either umbrellas or diffusers. 
One of the other things with um, the LEDs are if you're going to power them for a long time, even though they're um, sort of low energy, um, you you do need battery packs or sorry, big battery packs with them. Um, some of them don't run. We run some of the rotor lights on um, AA batteries and they're good as long as I'm keeping my shoot to sort of an hour to two hours, things like that. It does depend on the power you're running them at. Um, some of them have the plug-in batteries you'd see on video cameras. They work really, really well. Um, and you can get a day shoot out of them as well. But yeah, the LED panels aren't as um, sort of flexible necessarily. And they're generally bigger than your speed light um, in most cases, the ones that re you really want to create some really nice light. Speed lights, on the other hand, small, light, runoff AA batteries or uh, rechargeables um, is what we use in them. And then we can there's so many modifiers around for speed lights, diffusers, umbrellas, um, whatever you want to use, bounce them off the wall. We can tilt them. They're just so much easier to work with and they're not as challenging uh, as um, you think they are. I, I'm always surprised with sort of it's a it's a it's a light. Uh, it's a black plastic with some electronics in it. And it scares the life out of a lot of people. It, it, it's, it it's not really that scary. Yeah. Uh, really, if you you can make speed lights. Hi folks, <laughs> it looks like we may be back. Uh, unfortunately, we had uh, a power outage to our Wi-Fi system, so I do apologise. Uh, some comments about there, are there issues on your end? Yeah, I definitely think there are some issues in that we completely lost power. Um, so hopefully uh, you're still here, but we're gonna wrap things up. Apologies for the outage. Uh, Neil's, Neil's still with us. He's, he kind of turned all his lights out because he thought we'd finished, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, sorry about that, Neil. That's the gamble we take every time we go live, and that we might uh, we might end up losing the stream. So uh, apologies for the abrupt end, both to the viewers and to yourself, Neil. But I think we'd pretty much covered it, other than getting to people's questions. So apologies for that. But we covered a lot of great content there. So um, time for a glass of wine, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like not a bad idea at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, folks, for that. Let me just, before we say our final thanks to Neil, uh, obviously we didn't finish the show we, the way we'd like to, but if you, you could do me a favour, hit that subscribe button, hit that little bell notification, you'll be notified about all the shows we've got coming up here on Smug Mug Live. Uh, this is obviously the last one of uh, this week, thank goodness, uh, and uh, we've got a couple coming up next week. So next Wednesday, we're going live on Wednesday next week, I'm going to be joined by a good friend of mine, Kobe Brown, uh, Kobe will be joining us and discussing uh, the art of visual storytelling and we'll also be looking at a lot of his great landscape photography work and his travel photography and then on Thursday next week I'm joined all the way from Australia by the wonderful automotive photographer Easton Chang uh, who will be giving us an insight into his world of automotive photography and uh, lifestyle shoots including cars and that type of stuff so it's going to be really exciting next Thursday uh, but for now Neil thank you so much and thank you for joining us and for giving us your words of wisdom uh, I hope you're not too offended by uh, the quick curtain call <laughs> Not at all. It happens. We've had it when we're doing some Zoom broadcasts. But uh, as you say, it's the uh, going live. It's the risk you take with it. Um, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, again, apologies for the outage on the uh, Internet there. But that was sort of uh, beyond our control on that side of things. So uh, thank you, Alistair. And thank you, Smug Mug and Flickr for having me. Um, and I look forward to catching up with you soon, Alistair. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll have you back uh, at some point and uh, we'll uh, get out and get some pictures together soon, hopefully. That'll be great. But for yeah. now, thank you for your time again, Neil. Appreciate it. No Everybody problems. that's watching, stay safe, uh, be kind, be good to each other, and we'll see you back here next week on Smug Mug Live. But for now, uh, thanks very much. Goodbye. Bye. Cheers. Bye.